Hello, everybody. It's Connor Tuck here, and I have with me Ben Matthews from Northwestern Mutual. And today is going to be the kickoff of a three video series, at least for this first uh, component, where we want to talk about basically three different types of, I would say, add ons to your housing journey. First, in this first video, we're going to talk about life insurance. In the next video, we're going to talk about disability insurance. And in the final installment, we're going to talk about 401ks, Roth IRAs, and a little bit of what retirement planning is. But for this first part, let's talk about life insurance. So I talked with so many homeowners who end up just getting into their home, right? They're all settled in there, and then they just start living, and they're just doing their thing, and they're paying their bills and all that. And there's this, there's this rainy day in the future, right? There's this rainy day in the future where they may pass away, and they want to make sure, whether it be a husband or a wife or husband, husband, or whoever, and it doesn't always have to just be between your immediate family. There could be other beneficiaries, which we'll talk about for this policy. But we really want to talk about today, what is my first step if I'm, if I'm dipping my pinky toe in the water of life insurance? What is it? What are the difference between term and whole insurance? When should I get it? What are some of the parameters around getting it? Uh, and all of that. So uh, without much further ado, Ben, I'd like to welcome you onto the call. So I appreciate you being here uh, with me for these next couple of videos. So let's start with that first question, the simplest one we can start with. What is life insurance and why would I get it? Yeah, absolutely. So to put it foundationally, life insurance, I like to put it as the greatest love note, love letter you can leave for your family in the event that something were to happen to you and you're no longer around. And what we mean by that is if you die unexpectedly. And so you get life insurance to protect your family, loved ones, what have you, from the complications that arise from your unexpected passing. Right. And that can be to help pay off debt, like a mortgage, situate college education for the future, or again, help your family achieve the goals you would have liked to see achieved if you were still around without your presence being there. So foundationally, that's what life insurance is. That's why you get it. There are different types and um, you get it because you want to make sure that if something were to happen to you, you're still leaving the legacy you want to leave. Yeah. Now, I think, so riddle me this, and I'm going to just kind of ask some, some basic questions here. Why wouldn't I just save money, right? If, if I just save my money up um, and then in my will, I just give the amount of money I'd saved to my beneficiaries. Like, why would I do a life insurance policy instead of just saving money in my account and then giving, willing it down to, to my my kin, my next of it, you know, whoever? So wh wh why would I do the life insurance method. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, it's a lot easier to achieve the level of legacy you can leave behind with a life insurance policy rather than just doing that. Because for example, bare bones, like one of the lower recommendations I usually give for term life insurance, we'll talk about the difference between term and permanent in a moment, um, would be like $500,000. To save up $500,000, that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. And what if something were to happen to you in that in between, right? while you were in the process of doing that and that doesn't even go into the other complications of if you're spending all your time tucking away cash that's being eaten away by inflation and everything else you're sacrificing any other goals you might have and essentially too if you think about it most people minimum life insurance they want is things to be able to pay off their mortgage and other debt right and if you own a, ho a house, own a home, that, that mortgage is probably somewhere between two to five hundred thousand dollars. So, in and of itself, if you're just tucking away all that, you're putting more work behind than what is needed, for one. And it's not really situating yourself up the way that you think it is. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, we've talked. I mean, I know me and you just in our personal conversations, we've talked so much about. You know, seeing bank accounts with four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars in it, and and we just went through a massive period of inflation. By having that there, you've literally lost purchasing power just by having it sit there. By doing nothing wrong, right? You didn't do anything wrong, but you also didn't do anything right with it. You just let it sit there in limbo, and then it's being affected by the inflation. So, all right, so that makes sense. All right, I think the biggest question that we can answer because as soon as somebody start can, is going to start doing some research on it. They're going to get that kind of a textbook definition. This is what you leave behind. I totally get, you just said it there perfectly, right? You know, if I had my entire working career and I was going to work all the way through, I was 75 or 80 working and I could just save up money the entire time and live way below my means and never really experience a great life. Yes, 
I would be able to give a fairly large sum of money to my next of kin, right? Or whoever my beneficiaries are. But what if I don't live that long, right? What if I have an accident in five years, 10 years? I'm never going to be able to accrue that, that type of money to be able to set up you know, my fiance or to be able to set up the rest of my family or future children or anything like that off of that. So that, that, that's a good point. But the, the second question I think people are going to run into is, okay, I'm hearing this term life insurance thing, and then I'm hearing this whole life insurance thing. So let's, let's clear the air here. Let's demystify. So give me the breakdown here, term versus full or permanent life insurance. Yeah, absolutely. So really the best way to understand the difference between term and permanent or whole. Permanent and whole, by the way, they're one of the same, just different ways of saying the same thing. Uh, term is like renting versus buying, which is what you get with permanent. So with term insurance, it's usually very inexpensive premiums, again, all dependent on health and everything else. And you're renting a death benefit for a certain amount of time. So that can vary from 10 years to 20 years to until you turn 80 years old. And during that time, you're paying a premium to have, let's say, $500,000 in death benefit there for if something were to happen to you, that'll be paid out to your beneficiaries. Now, if you live past that term, right? So again, let's talk about, let's say you're 50 years old and you do a term 20 policy, right? So 70, uh, you live past that, the benefit's gone. The insurance is gone. You'd have to get a new one or what have you. So the plus side for really affordable price, you get a death benefit, you get that insurance. The downside, it's not yours. And if you live long enough, which is the ideal, right? That we all wanna live longer than what we have as the term policy, um, you don't see a result from that. Now, permanent on the other hand, you are buying the death benefit. So it is yours, no matter how long you live, if you live until your age 65, or 165, that company, in this case, Northwestern Mutual, would be paying your family that death benefit alongside the cash value. And there's another add-ons with permanent as well. Just like when you buy a home, you build equity in that home, you're building a cash value of permanent life insurance that you can access at any time. That's not stock market correlated. Uh, that has uh, significant tax benefits and is largely tax free as well as being tax sheltered. And there's a lot of different planning we can do around that from retirement to college savings to just having a really good nest egg put away through that. That again is not dependent on the stock market uh, for growth. So that's the really key difference. And again, you can get really into the weeds when it comes to permanent life insurance, but highlight is renting versus buying term is renting permanent is buying the death benefit okay so i think that makes it i think that makes a lot of sense so i'm going to try and just paraphrase back to you so if i'm getting term i'm basically just saying hey for this period of time i'm going to pay a premium a monthly premium right and if at any point in this let's take your term 20 example within this 20 years if, if i pass away i'm entitled to that benefit and it gets distributed based on the, the plan we set right but if I go 21 years, that is gone. And, and I basically don't have anything to show for it, right? I have just paid money every month to have the ability to have this payout, but there's nothing really accruing. Whereas with that permanent one, I'm paying into something that, it's, I would assume it's probably more expensive, on it, like all things being equal, as many of the terms of that, that you can make as equal as you can, it's probably more expensive to do the whole, permanent policy, right, on a monthly basis than it would be on the term, right? Am I reading that right? Yeah, absolutely. So with permanent, it requires more of an investment upfront, largely because not only you're buying the death benefit, but you're having a significant portion of that premium you're paying being reinvested into that non-stock market correlated account that's growing in value. So in exchange for that higher investment or price per month or per year, you're getting something you can access that's growing in value, just like buying a home is more expensive than renting an apartment or what have you, generally speaking. Now, and the other reason too is because term, the reason why it can be so inexpensive is because the relative advantages in the insurance companies uh, is with the insurance company because they're betting and is it more likely than not that you're gonna live past that uh, term stage. So they never have to pay out that death benefit. 
With permanent, it doesn't matter how long you live, they will be paying out that death benefit. It's a matter of when, not if. So yes, it requires more of an upfront investment, but you see more of a return. And largely, again, keeping budget in mind and everything, most people do a mixture, right? Depending as needs change and what their goals are surrounding that. Could I have both set up simultaneously? Absolutely. And that's what we would recommend. For example, a million, let's say you're in your 20s and you want a million dollars of term life insurance policy, which by the way, I have. That's not a crazy amount, right? That's because of the goals I have for my family, what have you, and that's pretty average. Um, now, term and a million dollars in term is way different in price than a million dollars in permanent. A million dollars in term, if you're in great health and you're in your 20s, could be like $40 a month, right? Permanent, that's hundreds to thousands of dollars a month, right? So not realistic, unless if you have an exceptional budget. So what would likely happen is we would determine, okay, well, we want permanent because we want to have this non-stock market correlated asset retirement or because of being able to pay for long-term care, whatever that reason is. Let's do like 250 in permanent, 250,000. That's the death benefit, not the cost. Um, and then the rest of the debt, remaining death benefit out of that million in term. And you can have those simultaneously. And one great thing, at least with the insurance we have here at Northwestern Mutual, you can convert term into permanent uh, in a certain amount of time. So for term 80, which would last in your insurance until you're 80 years old, you can convert to permanent prior to any time up to age 65, right? So you have this ability to add on more, but being very budget conscious and friendly. Okay, that makes sense. And I think there's an obvious kicker here too. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm ignorant in this, right? So I'm, I'm under the assumption that obviously somebody, like you said, in healthy in your 20s, right? With no major health issues, right? Versus somebody who's 62 years old, who's just looking to get this started immediately, trying to have the same coverage, I would imagine that there's a, a some form of a medical procedure we have to, not like a, we don't have to get a shot, like we just have to have a health report of where we are today. And that's used, right, to, I guess, assess the risk of the individual, the term, how long their policy is going to be. So give me like the basic rundown of maybe the couple criteria that Northwestern or, you know, any, really a lot of insurance companies would look at for this, but Northwestern specifically, like what are the, the major things that they're looking for in order to determine your eligibility and then also kind of your premium and coverage options? Absolutely. So health is absolutely a huge portion of whether or not, A, if you can be even approved for the insurance coverage and how much that could affect your premiums. Um, so what they're looking for in the application process, for example, you'd be filling out a medical questionnaire. And then very likely, because Northwestern Mutual cares a lot about the quality in terms of the policyholders, because we're owned by policyholders. So we want to make sure we're not taking on policyholders who aren't going to be good contributions, I guess you could say, to the overall pool. Um, and so we look through that and very likely you're going to have to have a nurse come out, paid for by Northwestern Mutual to take a physical, which would be reported to underwriting. And then you're premiums or what have you will be based off of that. Now, that's common insurance industry wide for one. And secondly, yeah, it can have a huge effect. For example, uh, if you're incredibly overweight or if you have some form of diabetes or any chronic illness, that could either change your premium level to outright making you uninsurable. It's a case by case basis largely. Um, and so, I just ran into this recently with people I've been working with. They're in their 50s. They're looking at permanent life insurance because of the long-term care advantage. And because they didn't have insurance prior, the premiums are up there and it's difficult. And I'm not even sure if they'll be entirely insurable. Now, which is why even if you're not in a situation right now, let's say you're in your 20s or early 30s, either you're engaged or not even in a serious relationship, but you know that life insurance is important, then go through, take a look and see about getting some sort of term coverage at minimum. Because what that does, you only have to go through the medical underwriting process once, unless if you add on a brand new policy. And so if you get, let's say $500,000 in term, guess what? 
you can convert that to permanent without having to go through medical underwriting, underwriting again, even if you're remarkably unhealthy in 10, 20, 30 years. So locking that in while you're insurable and while your premiums would be likely be much lower is at your advantage. Otherwise, again, it's in question of whether or not insurability and what the price of the premiums would be. So I think that's huge, right? The, the fact that, you know, obviously, right, in your 20s and early 30s is probably the healthiest you're going to be while you're also economically viable enough to even pay a premium, right? To even have the ability to pay a premium on a monthly basis. So if I if I go in, so I, right, I'm 32 at the time of us filming this. If I were to and feel pretty healthy, so if I were to go in and get my my physical done now, and I got a 20 year term policy, I'm assuming I can't do it like the year before it expires, or maybe I can. But at some point while I'm in that term, I decide, hey, I want to extend my coverage. I want to extend my term coverage, or I want to like create a like you said, I can have both simultaneously. So maybe I then start a whole policy that, that that's supplemental to that, or however the metrics work. But by then going to that, I don't have to redo the medical procedure at 47 or 50 when you know I, I just could be in a different place, right? So, so that's, I'm kind of reading that, right? Like if I get the term set up today while I'm in good health and I get advantageous premiums and an advantageous health report and everything, so I get kind of the best of the best of, of what you would consider there. And then I go through that period of time, I don't have to renew if I'm gonna either extend the term or add a full policy at that point. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. As long as you have that insurance, you will not have to go through medical underwriting again. Now, unless if you get a term 20, you can't extend the length of the term. So you would have to, there are different convertibles. I'm not going to go into the details on that because we can really get into the weeds on it. But unless if you were to get a brand new insurance policy, like example, if you let it lapse and then you're re-exploring it, you would have to go through medical underwriting again. But as long as you're within the period, uh, level 20 is within 10 the first 10 years or uh, term 80 which is before you're turning 65 you can convert that without medical underwriting and if you have a ride or two usually you can add on insurance benefit at any point in time without medical underwriting too depending on how that all works out which is why again it's really important to get that situated when you're healthy because we're never not well there are some other unique cases, but most of us will not be any he healthier tomorrow than we are today. And if you're in a unique situation to where you get the insurance and you actually do end up being healthier, you lost a lot of weight, what have you, whatever that looks like, I believe it's after three years you can go through a process called reconsideration and your policy will be adjusted to that better health rating and your premiums would be adjusted to that as well. So there is a possibility of it getting better but there's never a possibility of your medical rating being worse as long as you're not trying to get to a new insurance policy. Okay, that makes perfect sense. All right, so let's flip gears here. So I wanna think about, there's people are watching this and they're saying, you know, at what time in my life does it make sense to start the conversation? At what point in my life should I further the conversation? You know, when, so it makes some nice neat buckets for me. Like when's the, Earl, I mean, Obviously, I think that the kicker is the earlier, the better, right? The healthier, the better is always the time to do it. But if you were to say, like, in your 20s, it's the best time to do it here at 25 to 30 because, A, you're in good health. You can start earning an income. You can pay the term premium. Like, would you recommend a whole policy to that person at that point? Or, or is it, you know, toll is really only recommended as you get a little bit more up in years. Obviously, every case is different. But if you had to just give your best roundabout fit into these nice, easy buckets, like at what age should I start and what product should I start with? And then like kind of just like maybe walk me through the years, how that might change depending on when you enter this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of age, to minimum, and like in your 20s, for example, the minimum you should get is term, right? There is, I would, if you have the capacity and the means, investing in permanent is always better earlier just because you have more years of that cumulative interest. So it will pay off in the end but minimum term. Now, the caveat to that is, for example, if you never plan on having a family, on having anyone who depends on you or what have you, that's a clear part of your life plan, you don't have debt, then you may not need term, right? So the other caveat to that too is, let's say you're in your 20s, you thought that was your plan, and then, oh, actually, I met this person, gonna get married likely, wanna start a family, at that point, look at term as well 
right? So when you know you're going to have in the future people who are going to rely on you, that's part of your life plan, look at getting term. But again, to go back to those buckets, let's say in your 20s, term minimum, um, 30s, 40s, that's when it may be more makes sense to do some term to get that death benefit up because you have people relying on you again but really looking at whole life and permanent life as well 50s is when ideally you would have already had the term we would start converting as much as we can to permanent because we're starting to consider things like long-term care needs and other stuff like that long-term care for those who don't know that what i'm referring to with that is like nursing home needs uh having an at-home nurse stuff like that that usually becomes more relevant the older and age you get and is remarkably expensive which is an added benefit of permanent life insurance because you can have this rider the accelerated care benefit that you can use a portion of the death benefit to pay for that uh during your life but regardless that's kind of the process if you're in your 20s you're like i know i need this i don't know where to go at minimum start with that and then from there you have a lot more flexibility to add on whole as need be or what have you okay so that makes sense but really term is for a, I would say term is probably for a very large audience of people, whereas whole starts to become for a, a slightly smaller population of people. A budget, depending where they are just in their timeline of life, would start to depend on that and things like that. Okay, so that makes sense. That that last part you just said, that, that accelerated care uh, clause, I guess, or rider where it is. So that's yeah. interesting. So I have, this, I have this death benefit. I'm still alive. But in the last few years of my life, I'm requiring quite a bit more care right I, i'm requiring hospitalization i'm requiring you know nursing home care i'm requiring i'm sure there's a, a list of things that qualify or don't qualify but the gist is you can use some of that death benefit while you're still alive in those final years under some stipulated circumstances right is, am i kind of reading it yeah, right absolutely. yeah and one key thing to remember too with permanent that i didn't mention is not only are you accumulating this cash value but the death benefit grows as well as time moves on Right. So if you start off with $250,000 in permanent life insurance death benefit, that could be in the $500,000 range or $800,000 range in your 50s or 60s. And so with the accelerated care benefit, you're able to access a large portion of that for anything that's considered to qualify as a long term care need. Anything from having an at home nurse come to check up on you in your older age to having help driving, whatever that looks like, as long as it's justifiably because you're not able to take care of yourself in some way that can be used to pay for that which and nursing home is like the big one because on average nationwide the average cost per year is like eighty five thousand dollars a year for a subpar home so if you're in watching this and you're in your 40s 50s especially your 60s the big thing you start to think about is legacy well a nursing home event can deplete that significantly or make it so that you're not leaving behind a legacy or your legacy isn't $800,000, $1 million, $5 million. It's $100,000 in medical bills because of this nursing home, right? So that's the added value to it. It's a rider you get when you first apply for the policy. And it's really something that even when you're younger, I usually emphasize you get it because it's better to start planning for that sooner than later, even if it's not front of mind, because one day it will be, and you're going to want to have some sort of support there. And obviously, if you're at the point where you're in a, a nursing home, your ability to earn income to offset these costs is probably negligible, right? It is it's probably negligible at that point. So you don't want to bank on, you know, I'm young, healthy today. I can go out and I can work a full day. I can do five days in a row and I can compound on those weeks on end but at that point you're, you're just not going to be able to do that you're not going to be able to offset the expenses you have at that time with the income that you're getting so having something like this set up to protect that is super important i, I want to i want to jump to one more question here before we start kind of nearing the end here one of the things that i think a lot of people have heard about the whole life insurance is and you've said you've alluded to it here is there it has a cash value right and is that I guess there's a couple of questions like within this cash value conversation. And again, let, let's keep this general. I don't want to get too much into the specifics because like I said, there's so many caveats, but the, the general gist. One, it's like I'm paying a mortgage, right? So I'm buying, I'm getting equity in that project. No, you said something, you said, you know, when you first get it, you might have a $250,000 full benefit, right? Or a policy that's like $50,000. But by the time you're in your 50s or 60s, that could be $500,000 or 600000 
But you also said that it's not stock market based. So like, how is this growing? How is that death benefit growing over that period of time with the whole policy? Yeah, absolutely. So it's growing because of the overall accumulated value. So when you purchase it, just like how the value of your home goes up in time, with this, the death benefits value goes up in time. And then you have the cash value. Those dollars are invested in the general account with Northwestern Mutual, not with stock markets, other types. Uh, very. I don't want to go into too much detail because, again, don't want to get too far into the weeds. But with it, when it comes to Northwestern Mutual, we guarantee a minimum a 3% interest growth every year on that cash value. Right now, it's 5%. I actually think it just went up like 5.15% or what have you. And we also pay out a dividend, which adds to that. Because again, we're owned by our policyholders, not by stockbrokers. So we're stock owners, excuse me. So we're not paying stockholders, we're paying policy owners. And so as that goes on, yes, the death benefit values goes up. Your cash value goes up as well. And with that cash value, you can use that for anything at any reason, as long as it makes sense to, largely tax-free and is tax sheltered, which means, for example, one unique tool that a lot of people use this for is college planning for their kids. You can take out a whole life policy on your kid, not for the death benefit, it's wrapped around the death benefit. We obviously don't want to think about, God forbid, using that for our kids. But this accumulated value allows you to save up money for college without having to feel like it's locked in for college, right? If your child decides not to go, like a 529 plan is, it's not stock market correlated and it's tax sheltered. So student aid and stuff like that, FAFSA cannot count that in into considering their overall aid for student aid and scholarships or what have you. So as unique tools, you can use it as an asset to help with retirement. So if let's say the stock market goes down, instead of pulling from your 401k, you can pull from that and not lose that value. You can take it out for a down payment. You can take out loans against it. And guess what? Since you're basically your own bank, you can set the terms and conditions on whether or not you're paying back that loan, whether that starts in 10 years or you never pay it back. It's just deducted from the overall value when you pass on eventually. Um, and you can even have it do cash disbursements during your life, stuff like that. There's a lot of different unique tools you can use for this, which is why it requires more of an investment up front. But once it gets going, and usually I have it set, let's say you're in your 20s, paid up at age 65. So you're no longer paying premiums and it's still generating this. So there's a lot of different avenues for permanent life insurance. Okay, so it is getting like a compound interest per year based on the management of the fund. By Northwestern yep. Mutual, right? And how long has Northwestern Mutual been in business for? Oh, since the 1870s or so. <laughs> so you so can I, feel that, pretty that comfortable stay around. <laughs> that's it, right? It's that anytime I, I'm going to be parking cash with the, with the with an organization and it's going to be non stock stock market based, I, I have to have a lot of confidence in the institution, right? That that money is going to be there long term. And a company that's you know five times as old as I am. Uh, at this point is probably a good place uh, to start for, for something like that. So, all right, that makes sense. All right, Ben, well, as we near the end here, what, what have we not talked about here? What, what is something that we haven't brought up that's a common topic that gets brought up when you discuss life, life insurance with, with, with a client? Anything, really. I mean, what, is there an angle we haven't discussed here that you think is important? I mean, the real key angle to this is the way I'd like to, not necessarily something that we haven't talked on, but to emphasize again, is that this is a relatively easy investment, especially if you're looking at term compared to the cost of it, right? Because while it's very likely you'll live past the term insurance, you don't know. Life is unpredictable. The world is crazy. It seems to get crazier by the day. And not to kind of fear monger into getting life insurance, right? But there's a real value to protecting the foundation. You can do all this work, have excellent plans in place, have an excellent performing retirement account, a great savings, uh, minimal debt besides like a mortgage or what have you, and have these all these great plans. And then tomorrow something happens, you die, and now what do your loved ones do? You could be breaking in five hundred thousand dollars a year, you could be living paycheck to paycheck at that point or what have you, right? Compared comparably, and still. You think everything's going great and then you have that sudden stop. And so what this is, is kind of insurance that you leave your family to ensure like, I'm not here 
there's these goals I still want to see have happen. Here's this amount to make sure everything's okay. Um, wife, husband, you don't have to go back to work. Kids, you can get through college just fine if you want to. You can continue to be in the school district, you can continue to live in the home that we built together, whatever that looks like. So if you think that life insurance isn't important, think about who is dependent on you. Think about your plans for the future. And remember, you're not, you don't know what your health is going to be tomorrow, let alone five years from now. It's, it's better to start the conversation sooner. And if you're curious about how much insurance is appropriate insurance, that's where someone like me comes into play. Because we would actually take a look at what those goals are, where you're at in terms of liabilities, what have you, and see, okay, well, you need this much insurance. Or you don't have a monetary need for insurance, but let's protect your insurability, whatever that looks like. Well, Ben, I think we're going to wrap it up here for our first installment of this. So on the next two videos, I just want to remind you guys. So today was all about life insurance, right? Your full and your term life insurance. And hopefully we've done a good enough job of answering the basic questions. The next video is going to be all about disability insurance. And Ben, I think, remember, we're talking, what is the statistic around your the average likelihood that you will be disabled at some point during your working career? Do you remember the stat I'm talking about? So what is it depends on age and gender and all that, but let's say you're a male in your 20s, it's about like 30 to 35 percent of a chance. If you're thinking about likelihood and what's more likely to happen, it's a lot more likely to happen that you're going to be out of work because of a disability event than you are going to die suddenly. So both of these are very important. Yeah. And I think we've talked before even to this effect of, you know, hey, maybe maybe the idea of term and full life insurance is just a bit beyond you right now. And look, I, I get it. I mean, that was kind of my first re uh, gut reaction when we started having these conversations. I knew it's something I had to approach. Uh, and we're creating a timeline about when I'm going to be, you know, engaging in all of this. But the disability insurance on this next video that we're going to do to me was eye opening. Um, just what the different information that we've kind of gone through in, in preparation for that. And, and then just hearing what it is, it's something that is very approachable. And I think every single person should have this. I help you, and this is where we're going to end. I help people into their homes. What Anything could happen, right? And, and I come from my personal experience of we moved into our house five days after we moved into our house, my wife was hit by a drunk driver, right? And we didn't have a disability insurance policy set up for her. And she was out of work for months. But we just have this, we, have, we got a mortgage we have to pay. We have all these different things. And if we had thought about that, if we had had some of these things set up ahead of time, it, I know from my personal experience, and this is what I believe, is that it would have helped us tremendously through a quality of life issue that we had through those, through those hard months. Now, we're out on the other side of it. She's back to working again. And all is well that ends well. But that ne this next one that we do on disability is really important. And then the last video we do on retirement planning and the different avenues we have for, for tax shelters and doing different things to, to do good planning. Um, it's just invaluable. So, Ben, thank you very much. We'll make sure to put all your contact information uh, at the bottom of all three of these videos. And if at any point, you want to reach out to myself or Ben to kind of kickstart the process or just ask some basic questions, let us know. So anyway, that'll do it for us here. I'm going to go ahead and just stop our recording. But thank you, Ben. Thank you, everybody, for listening and hope to talk to you soon. Thank you very much.